Oh, hallelujah. Oh, come on, God, you're worthy to be praised. When your glory shows up, yokes are destroyed. Jeremiah was a prophet whose heart was broken over the sins of Israel. And he said something very profound in Lamentations chapter 3. He says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercy no. that we are not consumed. <laughs> That's right. Every morning his mercies are due. Great is your faithfulness, God. He recalls to his mind, and that's the reason that he has hope. He remembers. He looks back and he says, okay, God, I remember when I was in that place, but look at me now. You're so faithful. He's not telling God something God doesn't know. He's telling God what he realizes about him. Yes. That's what our praise is to God. It's not telling God something that he doesn't know. God, you're good. Your mercy endures forever. He already knows that. God, you're faithful. God, you love me. He already knows that. But he likes to know that you know what he knows. <laughs> That's why he dwells in the praises of his people. Ladies love men who give us compliments. If you are a single lady and you meet a man who's halfway decent looking and got a little bit of money in his pocket, not even a whole lot, and all he does is shower you with compliments, you will enjoy being in his presence. Mm -hmm. Because you know that's not what you want to hear. Don't you think God feels the same way? God, I know I got this house, but I sure wish I had an extra bedroom. Lord, I know I got five dollars, but it sure would be nice to have ten. Lord, you know I got long hair, but I sure wish I could get a haircut. Lord, I got short hair, I sure wish you could give me a weave. Lord, I this and Lord, I that. And Lord, 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 don't you think he gets tired of hearing all the things that he doesn't do? That woman I'm married to, she don't clean, she don't cook, she don't wash clothes. Don't you get tired of hearing that? You want to be complimented. And so does he. We're made in his image and in his likeness. So what we're going to talk about today is giving God your best. Giving him your best. All of us have given God something. All of us continue to give God something. We come to church. That's one thing that we can do out of obedience to the word of God. He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So we're supposed to come together and fellowship and encourage one another so we can be strengthened, so that we can learn what we gotta do when we get out there. Obedience, that's one thing that we can do for God, coming together as an assembly. We all pray to some extent. That's one thing that we're doing for ourselves, but for God, because he's commanded us to do that. Fasting is something that we can do for God because he's commanded us to do it. Reading his word, all of these things we do, but are we just doing it or are we giving our best? My best is not rolling over early in the morning just because somebody told me that I'm more spiritual and I'm more deep if I pray at four. So I roll over with my sleepy self and mumble a couple of words and fall back to sleep and don't even remember what me and God talked about. Is that really my best? Is my 4 o'clock a.m. sacrifice deep or is it my best? Maybe I wait till late at night to study the word when my whole day is gone and now I'm tired and now I'm just, I'm just barely holding on and I'm reading the word. Yes, I read my word, but is it my best? Am I doing just a minimal requirement or am I giving him my best? God is not a credit card. He does not want the minimum required payment. If the bill is $1,200, God does not want $30 a month. He wants your $1,200 with interest. Even when it comes to our weeks, there was a time, and actually still is, on every calendar, what day does the week start with? Sunday. Sunday is the first day of every week on our calendar. But the people of God, the saints, the saved folks, have made it the last day. Think about how you look at your week. Here comes Monday. Monday starts everything all over again. This is our mindset. So I'm going to work Monday through Friday, then Saturday I'm going to rest, and Sunday is church, and after church I dread Monday because that's the start of my new week. We have completely taken away the fact that Sunday is the first day of the week. That's the day that we have set aside to give God honor, to give God praise. And we have even put that at the end. All of our other priorities come first. What we do for 40 hours a week, that comes first. Then our rest, our golf day, sports, that comes second. 
and then by the way, I'll go to church on Sunday. What if we could just change the way that we look at things and make this the beginning of our week? God, I'm going to start out by worshiping you. I'm going to start out by being your word. I'm going to start out by doing what you call me to do out there and talking to people about salvation. That's how I'm going to start. I'm going to give you my best first, and then what's left, okay, the job can have that. When was the last time you went to work and you were tired because you stayed up too late praying? But we come to church tired because we stayed up too late watching movies, hanging out with the guys, on a date. When is somebody going to suffer for what we've sacrificed to God? Boss, I, I know I'm going to get it done. I know it's due at 4, and I'm going to have it to you by 3.59, but it might take me a little bit extra time because I'm running a little slow. I, I had to get up and pray last night. We don't do it. But we'll tell God real quick, Lord, I would pray, but i got to get up and go to work in the morning. Lord, you understand. Our priorities is all relative. It's all relative. When you have a graduation, when you have a ball, when you have a, a prom, we put on our best. Put on our makeup, get our hair done, put on the nice shoes, put on a pretty dress and expensive gown. When you get married, you give yourself, you give your spouse your best. You put on a nice gown and a veil. David had a very close and personal relationship with God. David made a lot of mistakes, but David knew where to go when he messed up. Right back to the face of God. And in David's messing up and in David's rulership, he did some things that God was not pleased with. And a prophet came to David and said, listen, this is what God is saying. God loves you, but you have messed up. So God is going to give you a choice of punishments. What kind of relationship do you have with God that he gives you a choice on how you're going to be punished? <laughs> that just amazes me. That God says, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. And David chooses the choice. And when he chooses a choice, he realizes that the people are suffering because he messed up. And as he sees this, he says, okay, God, I'm the one that messed up. I don't want everybody else to pay. So David is instructed by the prophet to go and inquire of God. Go and pray yourself this time. <laughs> Ask God what it is that you need to do. So let's look at verse 18 of 2 Samuel chapter 24. And Gad came that day to David, Gad is David's prophet, and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face, upon the earth. So this man who's a Jebusite recognizes that David is the king. He recognizes that he is to give him honor and he bows himself before him. He knows that there's royalty in his midst and he's immediately humble. And then in verse 21, Arana said, wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? Why are you here? And David said to buy the threshing floor of thee to build an altar unto the Lord that the plague may be stayed from the people. So David says to him, I'm coming to buy your threshing floor so I can build an altar. Because I need to pray to God and I need to offer sacrifices so that he will stop the plague that is killing my people. So in verse 22, Arana says to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Behold, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Arona as, as a king give unto, unto the king. And Arona said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Arona, Nay, not so, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. There's a couple important points here. First, this man Aaron, who is a Jebusite, recognizes that a king is in his midst. And because of David's position, because of his authority and who he is, when he finds out that he is going to build an altar, he says, listen, you're the king. I ain't stupid. You are the man. This is what you're going to do. You can take whatever you want. Matter of fact, not only am I going to give you the lamb, but I'm going to give you some oxen. You can use those as your sacrifice. Take whatever you want, no problem. The 
yourself. 